than our last talk. Um, Dr. Skok and I are unfortunately not on the same side today, but we uh, are all on Zoom together. So we'll, you know, it might get a little clunky when the two of us want to talk, but we'll we'll do our best. Um, our our topic today is posterior urethral reconstruction. And I'd like to have it interactive again because it's hard for us to know what disease states you see in um, Africa and what you what you what your patients look like. Um, but we will present uh, some scenarios that we encounter here in Seattle and in the United States. So this is our um, hospital again, and I think that we showed you this slide last time too, a big trauma hospital. Um, where we see a lot of pelvic fractures and urethral injuries related to pelvic fractures that are mostly blunt injuries, meaning motor vehicle accident, motorcycle accidents. Um, and we see uh, we are the only trauma hospital for five states. Um, so kind of busy. So the posterior urethral strictures, what the causes we see them from here are pelvic fractures, as I said, um, so acute injury, we manage them expectantly, um, meaning that, or in a delayed manner, we don't um, fix the urethral or uh, urethral or uh, bladder neck injuries in an acute state in a man, in a woman, and this is different. Uh, and I, I, we didn't include a lot of slides on women since it's very rare, uh, but we have repaired bladder neck injuries and urethral injuries in pelvic fractures for women as well. Um, and then we see um, strictures in the posterior urethra from um, instrumentation, like for a uh, TERP procedure for benign prosthetic hypertrophy. Um, the resection current can uh, uh, make a, a scar in the area of the bladder neck. Um, and then prostatectomies, the anastomosis that you perform can scar down. And we have patients that also get radiation for prostate cancer treatment. And we see strictures due to radiation, which are either around the area of the bladder neck or even the entire prosthetic fossa, or then um, more in the bulbal membranous urethra. Um, Dr. Gongo, what kind of patients do you with posterior urethral strictures in your hospitals? I think uh, a lot a lot of trauma, motor vehicle accidents. Um, of course, the anastomotic contract after radical prostatectomy and TURP. I, I, I've not seen a lot of radiation. I've not seen radiation related strictures and uh, the the trp you re, you have a resectoscope you you resect for the bph yep that one the this the the blood and neck contracture after the transurethral resection yeah it's common yeah good and we can speak a little more about that as we go to Perfect. This is our first patient. We unfortunately see quite a bit of radiation strictures and they can be quite difficult because the healing of the tissue is, is um, not optimal. I feel like that the uh, posterior urethral injuries or strictures that arise from a pelvic fracture, they usually are in young men who, have, um, who are usually healthy very few have diabetes or you know, smoking or uh, other comorbidities. Um, but the older patients we see that have received radiation for prostate cancer, they can be um, you know, not as healthy. Um, they might have cardiovascular disease, they might have diabetes. And, and then in addition to that radiation, destroys the tissues, not only the cancer, but also the tissues around. And those are a quite dif um, difficult strictures to fix, um, but we approach it kind of a similar way. And they're in a similar area as the pelvic fracture strictures. 
So this is a, an example of a patient who is 72 years old, he got radiation. And sometimes here in the United States, they get dual radiation, which is for the reconstructive urologist even worse um, because of uh, the radiation damage is even, um, even uh, more drastic. And the, um, we sometimes even see rectourethral fistulas from radiation because of the tissue um, that gets destroyed. It's not only the prostate, but the urethra and, and the rectum as well. Um, but this patient had external beam radiation and brachytherapy is the seed implant. Um, and those seeds stay in the urethra. Sometimes when we do the operations, we actually see those seeds kind of come into the urethra. And um, that patient presented with a membranous urethral stricture, so right at the area of the sphincter. And he had, an, and I would like to know if you have the capability of, of going endoscopically and incising stricture. Um, we either do that with a cold knife or we, some people do it with a hot knife or with a laser. Um, so the direct vision internal urethrotomy, the DVIU was done for this patient, but the, the um, um, in my experience, for those patients with radiation, that procedure doesn't really last very long. It's just temporizing and the scar forms right back. This patient has an undetectable PSA, so the, the radiation took care of the cancer, but left him with a stricture. So and we have some interrupt with findings uh, that are a near obliterative scar at the GU diaphragm. So right when you go down and mobilize the boba urethra, when you get to the pelvic floor, that's where the stricture was um, in the distal prosthetic urethra. And we performed uh, anastomotic uh, urethroplasty where we cut right at the area of the GU diaphragm. And in the cases of the radiation, we have to make sure that all scar is excised. And sometimes I have a slide on what maneuvers we might have to do to bring the urethra back together. But this patient required corporal splitting. So the corpora of the uh, penis were split and then uh, the uh, anastomosis was done. In patients who have a big defect in the pelvis due to um, the, uh, or due to dead space that we create, we usually fill it with a gracilis flap and we harvest that ourselves and, and swing that flap over. And I have a picture for you on that. Uh, we sometimes use it also for pelvic uh, fracture urethral strictures, um, but mostly for radiation strictures to bring in healthy tissue and promote um, healing. So this is a picture that you are mostly, most likely familiar with. You see here that you, I don't know, can you see my cursor? Yes, we do. Yeah, perfect. So you see the bulbar urethra is uh, uh, transected and you hear the GU diaphragm and the stitches for the anastomosis were already placed. You can see them in the, in the um, um, picture. And then you can see that the bulb, the sponge of the bulb is kind of retracted up. So you don't leave any sponge behind, but you're right at the GU uh, diaphragm and then perform your anastomosis. And this is where, um, how you can, or how this uh, imaging looked for this patient before and after the surgery. The arrow shows the narrowing. And this is a, a study where there is still contrast in the penile and um, bulbar urethra. And then you can see the patient's trying to void. That's why his prosthetic urethra is, is open. Um, and uh, the narrowing is right at the apex of the prostate and, and those little dots you see here are all the brachytherapy um, radiation seeds. And after surgery, there was this, um, still a little bit of a cavity, but that, um, um, and that's from radiation and necrotic cavity, uh, but that can re-epithelialize uh, itself. But you see here on that imaging that the urethra is wide, widely opened um, during, uh, after our surgery. This is three months post-operatively where you can see here, he has an open um, urethra. Pink. You can you can see the site of the anastomosis here, that like lighter, paler pink is the distal end. So that's the bulb. And then the, the um, darker pink further in is the prostatic urethra. Yeah. 
And as Dr. Hagedorn highlighted, the tools we use for radiation stricture are largely very similar or the same with the tools that we use for pelvic fracture related urethral injuries when we go in for a delayed repair. Um, so even though this disease state may not be something that you're seeing with frequency, much of what we speak about are the, the kind of core competencies we use for these cases. So this patient um, had, and, and what can definitely happen in radiation patients, they still have a leak um, after our repair because the tissues are uh, difficult to heal. That can also happen after posterior urethroplasties for pelvic fracture, but more likely to happen after radiation because the tissues are not as healthy. And so this patient had a leak um, and had this um, outpouching, but that eventually healed at about 12 weeks um, after our uh, surgery. We'll talk a little bit more about um, our gracilis muscle flap. So we use this for a number of different purposes and probably the most common is for some um, posterior urethroplasties. We don't often need it. We don't often find that we need it after pelvic fracture and it is more often necessary after radiation because after pelvic fracture, you have a focal area of scar. But as you excise that, a lot of the tissue around that is soft and pliable. And after radiation therapy, a lot of the, there's a, a field effect from the uh, radiation that causes even surrounding tissue to be a little bit more fixed and immobile. Um, so with the gracilis is an accessory muscle in the medial part of the proximal thigh. And um, this is also useful for repair of fistulas. For, for example, we'll use it for rectourethral fistulas. After we close and repair both ends of the fistula, the muscle serves as a spacer to, to prevent direct communication between our two stitch or suture lines. Um, uh, generally, after moving this muscle, patients do not have any functional deficits. And as you'll see, there are a few different ways that we can harvest it. And um, our experience has been that for the, in, for the most part, patients heal up the harvest site incisions without long-term morbidity at that site. Um, they can have you know, a couple bumps in the road in early recovery, but we have found that patients generally do quite well. The main pedicle for the gracilis is pretty easy and reliable to identify. It's about, um, uh, usually comes up somewhere around eight to 10 centimeters down the leg from the pubic tubercle. And we'll try to show you kind of a, a good correlate for that as we go through. This is an image using um, one of the traditional approaches with a long incision that spans much of the leg. We begin that incision around eight to 10 centimeters from the pubic tubercle, and it extends all the way down to just above the, the knee or just above the popliteal fossa. The muscle is pretty easy to identify once you get through the subcutaneous tissue. And um, it sits, its insertion sits on the, uh, goes to the medial aspect of the knee, just above uh, the semitendinosus muscle insertion. And it's the feeling the two, it, it's pretty distinct. And we find that when we're uh, going through this with trainees, it takes only one to three gracilis harvests before they can reliably reproduce this technique independently um, because of the consistent and reliable anatomy. So here we freed up the muscle off of its underlying structures. And you can see how far up we freed it relative to the groin crease. This is right around the point, probably just a little bit inside our incision is where you'd expect to find the primary pedicle. There can be a couple small secondary pedicles on the parts that we've mobilized already, um, but those generally are, are not the primary source of blood supply. You can um, either temporarily clip those and make sure that the muscle stays healthy, 
or more often you can just take those as long as you can identify that primary source, the primary blood supply. And, uh, and we'll rotate this in through a tunnel. So we develop a tunnel between the top of that incision where Dr. Hagedorn is showing you and our perineal incision. And we rotate it kind of downwards. And if, if you imagine we're doing the left side here clockwise, where the right side will rotate the muscle counterclockwise. And that prevents torsion, twisting, or tension on its pedicle, which is one of the most important things. And then we use that, we get a, a lot of the belly of the muscle in the perineum that we can use to wrap uh, around the urethra near our anastomosis, or to fill space next to or behind the urethra, or if we're doing a fist shoulder repair, to actually tuck deep into the perineum and pelvis um, to fill the space that we've developed between the urethra and the rectum. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Great. Uh, Dr. Skogan, thanks for uh, going through that. Um, what I notice here is that we used an inverted U incision to go to the posterior or very close to the GU diaphragm, sometimes even high to the bladder and neck. Um, I would be curious to see what you use as an incision. I think we have gone away from using that inverted U unless we do rectourethral fistulas, where this is helpful for exposure, but I think that a midline incision is, is okay as well. Some other reconstructive urologists use a lambda incision where they make an incision down and then splay that out on the bottom. But in my experience, the, the, the point where they come together tends to break down. I would like to know what, you, um, what kind of incision you make for your posterior urethral reconstruction. Is it an inverted U flap like you see here, or is it just a midline incision? I'll, I'll go first. You can use midline incisions. Mm. Most yeah, times midline. Yeah, that gives you good, it's good enough exposure, I think. Um, great. And have you had to use a gracilis flap um, yet or not so much because you don't have radiation injuries? Personal, I have not. Maybe my colleagues in Kampala. Uh, in Kampala, we, we have not had to use uh, the gracilis flaps. And uh, I'm intrigued at how it's used. Uh, and we, we for the, uh, the, those high strictures, we are using the, the lambda incision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't used the invited you yet. And I'm also intrigued to see how it's done. Yeah. Um, you know, you can see on this picture that we we might made little markings. These are the um, the sacral or the, the the iliac spines, and so we palpate that, and and the U basically goes from here to the inferior scrotum and down. Um, and the most important is that you don't make this flap thin. So when you incise, you go straight back. You don't want to go and shave it off and make it very thin, um, but the inverted U is basically you stay within the um, iliac spines and then you you go um, up into the inferior scrotum and down and uh, then incise right straight back. Um, the gracilis flap, I've used it once for a um, pelvic fracture related injury because we also had to do a partial pubectomy and then the, the space that's left behind is so big and I might be able to go back uh, to images or here, this one. Uh, this one, I think this surgery was actually a rectourethral fistula if I, if I remember correctly because of that inverted U that we usually use for those surgeries. Um, and you can see there's a lot of space here. You could potentially also, um, you know, put the put the um, tissue around it back together and kind of close the space. But in someone you have to use a partial pubectomy for and corporal splitting, the urethra is pushed all the way in and you, you're left with all the dead space. And that's when we tend to use a gracilis flap to fill that, fill that space. 
just a little question as we go along. Uh, I don't know whether you'll mention, we'll talk about it, but is the gracilis flap, does it fill the space between the ends of the urethra or it's used for secondary coverage? Secondary coverage. I, I, I mean, if you've got a discrepancy between uh, your, the, the distal urethra and, the, and where the scar is, I mean, if you remove so much scar and there's a gap, apart from the other techniques of, of rerouting, does the gracilis flap substitute the urethra or just fills up the space? It, it just fills up the space. We've used it in a ventral onlay before. If there's no good sponge because of fibrosis um, to support a buccal graft, then you could support that buccal graft with a gracilis that you swing in just like this. Um, so it sometimes is used, or most of the time, used to fill the space secondarily, but not to replace the urethra. And then other times, though, you could potentially graft the urethra. And if there's no good bed for the buccal graft, then you use a gracilis flap to support that graft. But for most, for most of the pelvic fractures, for example, the you know, as as you know well, the first step is to get the distance between the two ends of urethra such that you can bring them together. And then this serves just as a, an additional reinforcement filling space around that new connection. Judith, did you mean ischiospines or ischiotuberosities in marking out where to end with the inverted U? The issue of spines. You mean ischial spines or ischiotuberosities? Spines. spines. Okay. Did we answer your question, Dr. Skokan? Yeah. I couldn't hear the question very well, did you? Yeah, yeah. he was asking whether these denote the ischial spines or the ischial tuberosities. Ah, yep. Yeah. Perfect. This is a um, modification to the technique for the gracilis harvest that we learned from our plastic surgery colleagues more recently, where rather than making a full incision along the whole length of the leg, you can make an incision that's maybe a little bit less than a foot long, and then a second small counter incision. So we actually get the muscle near its pedicle, free it up, and then just release its distal tendinous insertion through that small counter incision Dr. Hagedorn is showing you now. And we usually leave drains in those people because they can develop a seroma um, under the uh, skin. And those drains stay for quite a while until they almost have no more output. That's important because you can get a, a large seroma that then can get infected. Um, but from a functional standpoint, the patient does very well. There's no sequelae that I am aware of functionally. An important, another important reason to drain this is if any collection, especially an infected collection develops, you know, because that muscle is tunneled to the perineum, it is seeing, that can see the same space where you just did your uh, repair, your reconstruction. Now we come to our other uh, cause of posterior urethral strictures is the pelvic fracture related injuries. And those are the ones that you, I think, are very familiar with. We just included a few pictures of def different um, injuries. There's a grading system that the AST brought out um, about grade two to five or one to five injuries. One is just an elongation. And then there's partial injuries where you can still uh, still see contrast going up through the urethra, but there's a tear. Um, and then you can see ones that are um, even more severe and, and the, the most severe is here on the bottom where there's no more attachment to the bladder. So the urethra fills and then there's um, contrast extravasation into uh, the pelvic space, but there's no more bladder and the bladder is kind of high riding in the, in the pelvis. Um, so you can you can um, 
identify those usually with a, a retrograde urethrogram um, and x-ray. I would be very curious to see how you manage your pelvic fracture related urethral injuries. Um, we have, uh, there was the push toward what we call a, a primary realignment. Um, you might have seen that in the literature um, where we take two scopes, one through the bladder and one through the urethra to try to realign the urethral ends and we then put a catheter through the urethra instead of placing a suprapubic tube only and letting the uh, urethra scar down and then go back at three months. The realignment was hoped to be something that um, could eventually lead to um, a healing of the urethra and no needing, not needing a urethroplasty, but ha that has now been proven um, that that's uh, very rare. Uh, only, you know, six to seven percent of patients do not need a urethroplasty after a pelvic after after um, urethral injury that got realigned. Uh, we still think sometimes the realignment would help with surgery later on because the two ends of the urethra can be completely offset due to the injury. So with a realignment, you at least bring them close together. But the realignment really doesn't push pull them together. So the defect that is the injury will just fill in with scar. Um, so so um, uh, we have not seen a, um, a high success rate with not needing any further intervention, but at least the urethra gets realigned. Importantly, also, we work closely with our orthopedic um, surgeons and they are obviously taking care of the acute pelvic fractures. And uh, another reason why we uh, include realignment for some patients is that um, from discussion with our orthopedic colleagues, they worry a lot about urine contaminating um, the field of pelvic hardware, and they are more um, willing and ready to perform what they, what they in their literature suggests may be better quality durable repairs of the bones uh, with, uh, with removal of suprapubic tubes or diversion of the urine in, in, in this way. So it, it's just an illustration of how for these complex injuries, um, uh, you know, dialogue as you probably all know very well with the other specialists acutely taking care of these patients um, goes a long way towards us uh, developing pathways to ensure the best global care. Even if it doesn't change what we do for them in the big picture, it changes some of the other parts of their recovery. And this is a, a pelvic fracture injury and, and you can tell how similar those pictures are from our radiation picture, right? We are back right at the geodiaphragm. And once we get into the scar, we, you know, we mobilize the uh, distal urethra and, and make sure that the, it's patent, but then the, the proximal urethra, once you're at the geodiaphragm, we usually put stay stitches on both sides and then with a knife carve out the scar and follow the lumen. And most of the time, the patients will have a suprapubic tube that gives us access anteriorly down from the bladder down into the posterior urethra, which is very helpful to finding that end because sometimes, especially in complete obliterations, you don't know where you find the proximal end unless you can palpate or sometimes we use a flexible scope to look down and follow the light. Um, sometimes we put um, rigid um, sound down the anterior bladder neck and down the urethra to be able to pal palpate that. So I think suprapubic tube access uh, or access into the bladder and, and integrate down is very important for those cases uh, to find the ends. And then again, um, excising all the scar and making sure that two healthy pink ends are, are attached. And we do that in that clock phase fashion where we put in 5-0 PDS suture or dissolvable suture, but that takes a long time to dissolve and, and we use 5-0.
suture for those. We have a question from Dr. Nasanga. Are all patients for EBRT catheterized per urethra? Um, and Dr. Nasanga, let us know if we're interpreting this incorrectly, but I think you're asking if for radiation therapy, external radiation, if patients have a catheter at the time that they undergo radiation. Um, and that is generally not the case. As long as a patient is able to urinate on their own, um, they routinely will not have a catheter put into place at the time that they undergo their initial radiation treatments. Good question. So this is highlighting some of the stepwise approach to bridging the gap so after you remove scar and identify the proximal and distal healthy portions of your urethra, whether you're performing that for a pelvic fracture or for a radiated patient, the next step is trying to bridge the distance between the proximal and distal stumps, um, uh, spanning that gap without too much tension or without significant tension on your connection. And you will probably be familiar with many of these steps, but working stepwise, firstly, we aggressively mobilize the urethra, and we find that you can mobilize the urethra up to around the level of the penoscrotal junction or the level of the anterior margin of the pubis where the suspensory ligament attaches to the penis. And with that approach, the rate of curvature afterwards, curvature of the penis afterwards is relatively low. If you, if you take that dissection further into the penis itself, that's where you can run into more trouble with curvature of the penis long-term once the patient is healed. If you don't get it, enough, we find that all patients will need some degree of mobilization of the urethra. If you do not get enough laxity to bridge the gap after that, to bridge the distance between the front and back ends or the proximal and distal ends, then you can divide the erectile bodies. We do that sharply, either using a knife and scissors or using a bovi cautery. Um, and we cut through the tunica albuginea of the erectile bodies, starting near the cruise where they split. We try to stay right in that plane of the tunica of the septum and separate intact tunica on either side. If you start to get into the spongy tissue of one erectile body, you can correct a little bit to the other side and generally close that up with absorbable sutures. And uh, we found that they, they, they heal that up pretty quickly. As you completely split the erectile bodies, you sometimes um, or many times will need to free them a little bit relative to their attachments to the pubis. Um, to develop some additional space for working. And sometimes that involves elevating a little bit of the periosteum at the attachment of the pubis, along with the erectile bodies themselves. That step is also really important if even after that maneuver, you haven't quite achieved the space that you need because the next maneuver we take on is removing part or in a small number of cases, a whole segment of the pubic symphysis. You can see in the image on the left, the patient displayed required a total pubectomy. So falling into that uh, small group that 3% of cases that um, undergo a posterior urethroplasty. In most cases, we can bridge the gap just by the first three maneuvers with taking out some small portion of the bottom part of the pubis. We have some bone instruments and I'm sorry, I, I should have gotten some photos of those to show you, but mallets, rongeurs, um, and a couple other uh, tools to elevate the bone, free it up, and actually remove a section of the bone right at the symphysis. And then sometimes we'll use bone wax to cover any oozing sites or any sharp edges. We try to make that resected bone a smooth surface. Um, and avoid sharp edges on it. But bone wax can be your friend if there's a, a, a tough little edge um, that needs covering. In a small number of cases, you also may need to perform 
uh, corporal or supracrural rerouting, where we bring the urethra around one of the crura of the erectile bodies, which gives you a little bit of additional length, or even move to a combined approach, uh, in addition to uh, this section through the perineum, also dissecting from up top from the abdomen, which often requires another surgeon to join you. And that's necessary to do a total pubectomy as well to get that a little bit of additional length, um, especially if you're anastomosing up to near the bladder neck itself. We have a couple questions in the chat. Um, at realignment, is the bladder opened? We um, generally will perform the realignment with two surgeons and we will at least temporarily place a suprapubic tube or a suprapubic pathway. Um, we have tools to put in a, we have a, a sheath that lets us pass a cystoscope. So a small, maybe centimeter long or centimeter large incision in the bladder itself that lets us pass a flexible cystoscope into the bladder for that realignment. And ideally, we like to leave the suprapubic tube in place, although sometimes we um, permit removing it afterwards um, if it, it'll impact on our orthopedic colleagues' plans. But usually, we don't need to open the bladder. I can think of a couple cases where the patient needed an open repair of a bladder injury as well, where we used that opportunity to perform their realignment in an open way. But usually, it can be done without needing to more formally open the bladder. And then Dr. Hagedorn, one more question in the chat. Up to which level are the corporal bodies separated? How far distally do you go? Good question. So the corporal, I would say maybe for about two centimeters, three centimeters, until you kind of can palpate the pubic bone or pubic symphysis behind it. Um, well, I think that it's not for every patient the same. Um, I would also say about the corporal splitting that I do that pretty early on if I know that we are dealing with a membranous, um, distal prosthetic, uh, uh, urethral stricture. I, I do the corporal pretty splitting early on to create space um, so that you can visualize everything better. Um, and as Dr. Spokan said, we do that sharply. And in some patients, it's a very nice plane where you can go sharply between the corpora and you don't get into it. In other patients, you keep on trying to readjust and you end up in the corpora on each, both sides, which can be um, a little frustrating because you get into bleeding on each side, but you can over sew that easy, easily as Dr. Skokan was uh, uh, describing, but I would say maybe a, a two centimeters of splitting initially, and then you can carry that up into the more um, a distal penis, but not not very much more. Dr. Skokan, would you agree? Yeah, you don't want to, you want to be careful not to carry it too far, especially beyond the anterior margin of the pubis, because then you can start to get to where the dorsal neurovascular bundles are getting closer to midline in the penis itself. And so you can run into some trouble um, if you carry it out too far and straight to one side. So we try to keep it just to exposing the pubis itself. Good question. So outcomes from the surgeries for pelvic fracture related strictures um, stricture free rate is pretty good, 90%. Um, you can see on the on the right hand side there is a, a picture of a, a bad stricture, and you can see the plates in the pubic bone. That's also actually something that we haven't talked about yet, but sometimes the pubic bone gets plated by the orthopedic surgeons. And I usually give the surgeons, the orthopedics uh, surgeons, a heads up if we take those patients to the operating room because. Rarely they have to remove the plate for us to do that inferior pubectomy. Um, and they would do that through a fan and steel incision rather than through the perineum. They would have to make a different incision to remove those plates. But usually 
um, months after surgery from the plating, the, the plates can be removed and do not need to stay for stability. There's lower extremity complications, which are 10%, and we've definitely seen those. It's a compartment syndrome of the lower extremities can be quite the devastating complication, but we, we definitely see it, especially if the surgery goes more than five hours. And what we've done uh, recently is get the legs down um, at around two, three hours before we you know, proceed with an anastomosis to let the legs rest. And uh, we keep the legs down for about 20 minutes and then put those legs back up into high lithotomy to prevent lower extremity injuries, nerve injuries, or compartment syndrome. And transfusion rate um, is um, 5%. And I feel like the, there's a big difference between radiated patients who have basically devastating uh, blood supply to that area because of the radiation, but the pelvic fracture related um, strictures, those patients are young and there's only that scar from the um, from that injury and the patient has very good blood supply. So you can get into quite a bit of bleeding in those patients, especially around the pubic bone. Um, and the catheter gets left in for two to three weeks, sometimes even four weeks if the repair, uh, repair was difficult. Um, and a lot of patients, they, they have erectile dysfunction up to even 50%. Um, percent. And that might be there even before the surgery because of their pelvic fracture that injured nerves, blood supply, uh, and Urinary incontinence, not so high, about 5%, uh, because the prostate and bladder and neck are still there um, and serve as the um, continence mechanism. A rectal injury um, is rare, but can also happen. Dr. Curia um, asked, what have we observed as predictors for erectile dysfunction in our patients? And that's a really, really good question, diving a little deeper into um, some of the things we're talking about here. Um, the teaching that, that we learn is that um, the rate of ED after a pelvic fracture urethral injury, we know that to be very high. And we think that the primary driver, as Dr. Hagedorn touched on, is um, injuries to the nerves and or blood vessels at the time of their original trauma. And we don't think that the repair itself is a major driver of new ED in most, uh, most patients. We do occasionally see patients who have ED um, have good erectile function before a posterior urethroplasty and have new ED afterwards, but the vast majority have ED to begin with. The urethral injury itself, as part of their pelvic fracture, is strongly associated with a high rate of ED. Um, and then we're, we're exploring other specific predictors in, in some of the more general pelvic fracture population. But even without a urethral injury, there's a pretty high rate of erectile dysfunction after a pelvic fracture. ED, importantly, can be a correlate for, um, as we touched on, some injury to the vasculature and maybe a predictor of more challenging cases or um, a greater likelihood of failure of the repair, difficulty healing the repair. The primary blood supply to the urethra is all off of branches from the internal pudendal artery. The three main branches, the just to review the dorsal arteries, the cavernosal arteries, and then the paired bulbar or bulbourethral arteries. And in the United States, we see a reasonable number of patients who have very severe pelvic trauma and either have a laceration on the internal iliacs or the internal pudendal or need to get an embolization. So need to get those um, blocked off temporarily as a small procedure with our interventional radiologists. And that may affect how blood restores and arteries uh, restore blood flow into the penis and to the urethra itself. And we have, our experience has been that at least a small number of patients were found later to have arterial insufficiency and uh, uh, diminished arterial inflow um, can have much more challenge healing the connection of the urethra after a urethroplasty. So we've learned more and more that trying to identify these patients before you take them for a complex repair may serve them well 
to give them the best outcome, best likelihood of healing up and not needing a revision repair or a more, even more complicated procedure down the road. We investigate this by performing an ultrasound. Sorry, Dr. Hagener, can you go back real quick? We investigate this by doing an ultrasound in patients that really worry us. So the patient that has no erectile function since the time of their injury, even if they're several months out, or that has other correlates, maybe nerve dysfunction or sensation in the penis or in the glands. Um, those are the folks that we work up. And in the top picture here, we, we see some images of us doing the ultrasound, measuring blood flow to the penis itself. I, I, do you, I'd be interested to hear, do you have ultrasound available um, at your hospitals readily in, in clinic or, you know, not in the acute period, but in follow-up for patients? And are, do you perform ultrasound studies of the penis currently for this or for any other reason? Maybe we can circle back to that as we go. Um, in those patients who have arterial insufficiency, we'll show you a little on this, but um, we can create and bring in a new blood supply from the epigastrics, which is shown on the bottom. We're doing an angiogram to find the epic inferior epigastric arteries. And we work with a microsurgeon. Here we work with our plastic surgeon, but you can also do this with a urologist trained in microsurgery to create a new vascular connection, the arteries and veins. Or the, uh, the artery into the penis, um, one of the dorsal arteries is connected to that epigastric that's brought down from the abdominal wall. And then we let that mature and then come back a few months later to perform our urethroplasty after we've augmented the blood flow into the penis in this way. All right, let's go ahead. All right, and we, we've definitely seen uh, posterior urethroplasties fail. Those are very difficult scenarios um, because the defect that is usually there is then very, very long. And as Dr. Skoken said, we do use ultrasound and angiogram to see, you know, if there's good blood supply to that area. And most of the time we don't do that for everyone with a pelvic fracture. Some patients for their pelvic fracture got iliac artery embolization to stop the pelvic bleeding. But even in those patients, um, they usually use gel foam that kind of dissolves. And I think that blood supply kind of gets reestablished again. So we don't do that routinely, but in someone who has a failed urethroplasty, it's wise to assess their blood supply because that's probably the reason why it failed. Um, maybe there's also some tension and other reasons, but uh, it could be a blood supply issue. So you wanna know that. And you can see here, this is a patient who had a, has a huge defect um, between the um, membranous urethra and the kind of penile urethra. I think the entire bulbar urethra is wiped out and obliterated. And we've done a few of uh, these substitution urethroplasties now at um, our facility, working with closely with our plastic surgeons. Uh, we use a radial forearm flap and the urologists our role is to expose the proximal urethra and the distal urethra and then the um, obliterate segment is, is removed um, and then the microvascular anastomosis of that free flap is done by our plastic surgeon. So this is a case where there is urethra up here down below is the, the other end and it measures 10 centimeters. So there's no way you can get those two ends together. And um, the plastic surgeons, you know, we measure the defect and make an outline on the forearm and have the radial artery uh, here in, in vein. And then the, the harvest is done on the forearm by the plastic surgeons. Uh, the uh, forearm free flap is then rolled over a catheter and then um, you can see here the pedicle and the uh, um, uh, rolled up uh, skin flap. And then that gets um, uh, connected to a branch of the femoral um, vessels in the inguinal region. Um, and the pedicle is then um, 
or the, the flap is in place in the perineum and you can see here anastomosed to the very proximal end and then to the distal end and the pedicle exits through the left groin um, and gets connected by our plastic surgeons that you can see here. They do that under a microscope um, and use, I think, 10-0 suture to um, sew together the ends of the um, artery. Very rare um, lead do we have to use that, but this patient did very well. You can see on imaging his urethra is uh, patent um, and the incision sites have healed very well. You can almost not notice on the, on the forearm. Uh, I think this was a young, very young patient, um, a child I think that this was used on. Um, and if the prostate and, and bladder neck are in place, there's very um, low likelihood that the patient is going to be incontinent. But of course, it could happen that there's some incontinence because the sphincter is, is usually affected in those cases and, and the, it's transected or excised even if there's scar in the sphincter area. Another approach for the extremely complex case may be using some of the intestines. So um, we've not needed to use this technique with the patients that we have taken care of. And from our experience and collaborations, um, our usual go-to for the very challenging case is the microvascular repair, the forearm free flap. But recognizing that at each of your sites, you may not have a microvascular surgeon, but you may do bowel surgery regularly or work with colleagues in general surgery who do bowel surgery regularly, this may be one of those rare tools to keep in the back of your mind or have in your armamentarium. Dr. Tony Mundy's group out of London in the United Kingdom um, had a great paper showing this technique back in 2010, 2011, and I can share it with any of you if it would be helpful. But in their experience, you can isolate any of a couple different segments of the colon, the small intestine, or the stomach, and they describe mainly colon and stomach. Separating a segment, reconnecting the intestines if you use the colon, and then freeing up that segment. As you see on the left image, um, uh, the segment B is what's used. Freeing that up on its pedicle so that it's mobile with its mesenteric pedicle still intact. You do need to perform at least a partial and probably a total pubectomy to be able to pass this down and not constrict that mesenteric pedicle. But once you free this up with enough room on that pedicle, you can then bring the um, segment of bowel down into the perineum and tubularize it and connect it just like we did with that radial forearm to the exposed urethral stumps proximally and distally. And exactly as Dr. Hagenorm is showing, you can see this mesenteric pedicle going down underneath the bone after a partial pubectomy. And then in, in, the, um, in the image on the right, the top bracket and bottom bracket are showing the levels of the connection between that intestinal loop and the urethra distally and the urethra proximally. Obviously, this is something really to think about it only in those rare, very challenging cases a uh, patient that may have failed an initial urethroplasty and has a long defect, and certainly would be something to um, only consider if you're doing some bowel work regularly, maybe for cystectomies, or if you work with a general surgeon who does bowel work regularly, who might be able to join you uh, to help with uh, a more complex procedure of this nature. But it can be a versatile tool, at least in those rare, important cases. Uh, this, this concludes our talk um, right on time, I think. Um, but we are open to, to answer any questions you may have. And I also am curious, you know, what kind of maneuvers you've had to use in the past for your posterior urethroplasties. Thank you so much for joining everybody. I know it's in evening time. Are you? Dr. Kagongo, go ahead. Yep, I have uh, uh, the question 
with the first case that you recall, you mobilized the urethra. What what happens to the spongiosal arteries? As if as if you said you moved the whole bulb. The the first case you discussed here. Great question. There are two ways that you can approach the distal part of the urethra. The traditional and most standard way, which we use most often for a patient with radiation, um, is to completely separate the bulb. So you divide the bulbo-urethral arteries bilaterally, and then that bulb is relying completely on blood flow from the dorsal arteries, so completely on retrograde blood flow through the glands. That's important because you can't rely on that in a small number of patients. Maybe the, the patient that has arterial insufficiency is an easy example. Also, maybe a patient who has a history of um, a separate urethroplasty further out distally or hypospadias. That's probably the classic that we see here, where that connection in the glands has not matured or may be disrupted. Dr. Gomez, Ronaldo Gomez, who's in Chile, has published on a modified technique that can be a little more challenging, but is uh, really, really neat and really great to actually uh, separate out the urethra itself at the level of the sphincter and the membranous urethra, keeping the bulb and the bulbar arteries intact. Um, and it, I can also send you that paper if it would be helpful. Um, but you're able to actually keep the bulb connected, get at the urethra and just cut out that segment and then uh, the disease segment and do an anastomosis um, following your excision. And my, my second question, what were in, still in this case, I wanted to see the genitourinary diaphragm and you, you said the, the sphincter was involved. Was it resected? Do you dissect underneath it? Because I think it's at risk there. Very good question. In my experience, the sphincter, um, it's hard to see it, but most of the times, in, in this case, it's a radiation uh, stricture. So the sphincter is within that scar. And um, so we usually resect it because we resect, we have to resect all the scar. Um, I have um, seen a video and also heard of sphincter sparing um, urethroplasty, um, but that can only be done if the sphincter is not embedded in the scar and part of the problem, basically. Um, so uh, in my experience, once the sphincter area or the membranous urethra is part of the, um, the disease, then you, you have to excise it. In, mm -hmm. in my training, how, we, uh -huh. sorry. how do you handle the incontinence then? It, it's, it's a must, the patient becomes incontinent, isn't it? Not necessarily. If their internal sphincter is still functioning, then the, the internal urethral sphincter at the bladder neck, then they should still maintain continence, relying upon that. And a majority of pelvic fracture urethral injury patients will have that internal sphincter still functioning. But that's where it's important, you know, about our experiences, about 5% um, may have dysfunction that leads to new incontinence afterwards. And in radiative patients, the rate of new incontinence, if they don't have it before surgery and they still have their prostate, they haven't had a prostatectomy, uh, the rate of incontinence is somewhere in the range of 15 to 20%. Great question. Well, if no other questions, we, we just wanted to say it was really great to have another opportunity to speak with you about another topic really interesting to us. And we hope that some of the discussion, the tools that we spoke about, um, are interesting to you and also help to augment your, your toolkit for taking care of some of these really challenging cases. Thank you so much, Dr. Skokan and Dr. Hagedorn.
Uh, we appreciate, uh, would you be able to share for us the, uh, with us the link for this talk, please? Absolutely, I'll be able to send you guys the, the video. I appreciate it. thank you. Thank you so much.